and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us today. And uh, so we're here today to talk about just animal health training and how we can look to transform Form it into engaging learning experiences. What we're looking to do ultimately is boost performance and support those people that work in animal health, right through from clinical staff to sales and marketing teams. Today on our panel, we have three walls. My name is Becky. I'm a veterinarian and I'm learning solutions consultant here at Wolf. And I will be quizzing my lovely teammates today who've agreed to join us. We have Charlotte Rodier, who is an amazing veterinary nurse and one of our top project managers. Hi, Charlotte. Hello. Hi, thanks for coming. Mm -hmm. And we also have Joanna Kapiuska, who is our award-winning senior developer and articulate extraordinaire. Hi, Joanna. Hello. Hi. Mm -hmm. Thanks both for coming, not making me be solo today. So let's get started. We're here today to talk about transforming animal health training. But what are the most common learning options in animal health? To let Joanna and Charlotte get settled in, we'll launch this as our first poll for today. So as an audience, let's find out what your experience has been. What learning formats have you experienced most often in animal health? Would you say it's been face-to-face -face presentations, self-learning reading material? Do you mostly do webinars, e-learning modules, or do you do video-based learning most frequently? Let's see, we're getting quite a lot of answers coming in so far, which is great. A lot of people going for webinars, which is not too surprising. Just give you a couple of seconds more just to see. OK, so I think that concludes the poll there. Most people there, 73 percent have gone for webinars and followed by we've also got some quite an equal split there with e-learning modules, self-learning reading materials and face to face learning, uh, face to face presentations. Um, as a vet, I would say the majority of CPD that I've done has been offered in a in a more passive format. So I generally experienced a lot of uh, top-down lunch and learn presentations, turn up, grab your sandwich and have a little listen, um, non-interactive PDF documents. And obviously there's a lot of great webinars there as well. I did find that there were some more interactive face-to-face -face training that was an option, but really difficult to get booked on with uh, practice finances and, and clinic hours. Charlotte, what would you say your experience was as a, as a vet nurse? Yeah, similar to you, really, I would say so mostly lunch and learn are the ones that probably stick out the most. Um, and yeah, just kind of like reading through sort of fairly dry content a lot of the time. Trying to remember afterwards is tricky then, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so we're here today to talk about transforming these passive learning options, as depicted by this, this girl who looks very interested on the left, into more of a learning experience, as you see with the girl on the right. But what do we mean like by that, what should learning be? So essentially, any learning program should enable learners to achieve the desired learning objectives. It should have a, a human-centered design so that we not only generate increased knowledge, but also impact skills and performance, which is ultimately what we're looking to do. And to really achieve that, we feel we need to embrace a new paradigm. So most importantly, we need to put the learner at the center of everything, analyze their motivations, their pain points, their barriers to change. Why aren't they doing the behavior we, we would like them to do after the learning so that we can work out how to most effectively approach them. We should also look to transform the, tra the traditional trainer role. Go from somebody that distributes a form or a PowerPoint to more of a facilitator, a coach, a mentor, which is something that's becoming a lot more common now. And thirdly, we need to look at taking a step-by-step -step approach, consult the learners, integrate feedback, and move more towards a co-creation so we can really make sure that we're getting that, that learning at the right level. This helps with that level, as, as I said, but also um, with making sure that the learners are engaged in the learning that we create. So to transform training into a learning experience, what do we need to look at? For our discussion this lunchtime, I will interview Charlotte and Joanna on the following key areas that are involved in creating a learning experience. We'll look at content transformation, we'll look at instructional design, user experience and innovation. So first up, we have looking at content and specifically how to make it as memorable as possible. So Charlotte, I'll come to you for this first topic because as we already said we've experienced a lot of difficult to remember content yeah um animal health training has a tendency to be very content heavy why is that do you think 
Um, I think any scientifically based content tends to be very detailed uh, due to the level and importance of the information. Um, for example, veterinary content can be very technical in places with lots of veterinary terminology, etc. Um, the type of content that we often receive is written by experts who have got extensive knowledge in their field and often don't like to leave any information out. So how, what can we do then to really try and improve the retention of that knowledge? Because as you mentioned yourself at the beginning, when you're just reading it, it's it's very tricky to, to really retain too much at the end of a session. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, there's many different ways to improve the learner's retention of knowledge um, with particularly content heavy subject areas. Um, so the first thing to do is curate the content. So we basically break it down into manageable chunks of information get rid of the more waffly bits if you like and just stick to the need to know pieces of content um, meaning that we still achieve the learning objectives but without clouding the main points. Um, once the content has been curated we then need to think of an imaginative way to make it more memorable therefore allowing the learners to retain that information. Um, this can be done in several different ways for example creating a story or scenario that the learner can relate to in real life uh, maybe presenting information with enhanced graphic design to make it um, visually appealing and more engaging. Okay, I mean, it sounds great in theory, um, but would you be able to share us some examples, maybe look at some of the content you've started with and yeah. how you've then transformed it? Yeah, sure. So the first example we have is a project we worked on with TVM UK. Um, so they were launching a new epilepsy drug and they wanted to release some learning to boost the product launch. Um, they had an existing PowerPoint lunch and learn, and we recommended an interactive e-learning module based on this, uh, on this content, on the PowerPoint. Um, so the learner was put in the shoes of the vet and had to treat a seizuring dog appropriately, so making the correct um, clinical decisions every step. Um, so we can see um, here the emergency triage conversation over the phone, and then the learner had to complete a triage form, so similar to filling out a history in real life. Um, so really involving the learner and also testing whether they were paying attention as well <laughs> to the phone call. Oh, that's great. And why, I mean, in situations like this, why would we recommend a clinical scenario in animal health training, for example? Um, yeah, scenarios are great. So um, scenarios which can be clinical, um, as in this example here, um, or perhaps like a sales based scenario. Um, they're great for boosting knowledge retention. Um, and the reason they're so good is that learners have the opportunity to directly apply what they're learning into a realistic, relatable situation. So it's relatable to their day to day job. Um, and I think the best thing is it allows them to make mistakes in, in like a safe environment um, before being unleashed into the real world with real clients or customers. So almost like with the sales stuff, like a virtual role play, almost without that sort mm -hmm. of face to face part. Yeah. Cool. So can you share any other examples with us of content transformation? Uh, yep. Yeah. So the second example we've got is a project we worked on with Boehringer Ingelheim UK um, to train SQPs on ruminant antiparasitic medications. Um, so these are a couple of screenshots from a PowerPoint presentation they gave us on lungworm and cattle. And we transformed it quite significantly, I think you'll agree, um, into an interactive e-learning module with a men in blue theme. Um, we also included some uh, gamification with quizzes and a scenario at the end. Um, now gamification tends to be quite a buzzword around e-learning and it basically means adding a game element to the learning. So adding some scoring, um, if you get uh, the answer correct, you earn a star, that kind of thing. Um, a lot of learners enjoy this aspect as I think secretly we all like to play games <laughs> and maybe some of us have a competitive streak as well. Um, so yeah, this is another example of how we can create a fun story or a theme to increase engagement and also knowledge retention. Yeah, I think I can definitely relate to that competitive side. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think a lot of vets and, and vet nurses are secretly quite competitive anyway. So how else can we look to transform our content into memorable experiences? Um, so I'll give you the final example. So this was a project with Royal Cannon and um, they wanted to create a series of e-learning modules on canine breeding. Um, I remember going to the kickoff meeting in France and they handed us this really thick book on dog breeding. And I remember thinking, gosh, how are we going to transform this? <laughs> Um, but I think it was about 22 modules later, uh, I think it was, we managed to break down all of the content, cover all the subject areas they wanted us to with some like really fun and interactive modules. 
Cool. Some great examples there, Charlotte. It's nice to see how the design can be can be very different there. So if anything Charlotte said sparked any questions for any of you, again, please use the question and answer box and I will quiz Charlotte for you at the end. So Charlotte, get yourself ready for that. <laughs> the next dimension on our list was instructional design. So this is all about learner centricity. So, so far, Charlotte's talked us through how we can take some scientifically heavy content and imagine a relatable story to fit it into. But what next? What after that? How can we create learning courses that have a meaningful impact for the learner? So again, Charlotte, we'll come to you for this one. If you can talk us through how that works. Sure. So um, it's really important with any learning course that we really think about the target audience. So what motivates them, how we can impact their behaviour. Um, so for that reason, we don't jump straight into the media selection. Instead, we start every project with a strategic kickoff meeting just to define the objectives and the entire scope of the project. Um, so this ensures that we build the project around the audience so that the programme we design meets the learning objectives and the technology and approach selected means it will be accessible um, and effective for the desired audience. Um, so obviously a big part of that meeting is the audience analysis, which you can mm -hmm. see um, a screenshot of here. So we analyse the behaviour we want to change, um, the causes behind their current behaviour and how we can motivate them to positively change their behaviour. So, for example, the approach to teaching sales reps a new sale technique for a new product will need a different approach to teaching clinical staff about um, that new product and how to use it in practice. Um, so it's not just a case of getting a PowerPoint of content and changing it into something else. We really put the groundwork in and research at the start of the project, you know, brainstorming, mm -hmm. learning objectives with our clients, finding out as much as we can about the audience so we can make sure that the learning course is as effective as possible. You must find it really helpful being a vet nurse in that situation, being yeah. able to relate to the audience. Yeah, definitely. I think that's something that um, a lot of our clients quite like, because obviously, you know, myself as a nurse and other team members uh, as vets, you know, we've, we've been there, we've been in practice, we can relate to the, the subject matter um, mm -hmm. directly. So it's quite useful. Great. So keeping the learner in the centre of our course design seems it, you know, helps to effectively change their behaviour. But how can we make sure that it's actually physically accessible for the desired learner? Um, so there's two things here, really. So firstly, the actual device that the learner would use to view the course. So we develop courses for learners who will be viewing a course on their smartphone. So particularly those busy vets and nurses who might be doing a quick bit of CPD on their lunch break uh, in, in clinic or sales reps who are on the go. Um, we also develop courses that are predominantly viewed on PCs or laptops um, or in the case of sales reps, often it's tablets such as iPads. Um, so we'd, what we do is we discuss the individual requirements with the client before starting the project um, during the audience analysis, um, find out about the devices the learners will be using so we can design the course appropriately. Okay. Um, secondly, we decide on the delivery package. So in the case of an e-learning module, does the client have an LMS, which is learning management system, um, where the course might be hosted? Um, or are we delivering a more straightforward PowerPoint presentation that can just be delivered as it is? Or does our client want to embed the course into their website, for example? I'll hand you over to our senior developer, Joanna, who can explain a little bit more about the technical side of things. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, so yeah, for the LMS delivery and hosting option, um, there are many types which allow hosting of different technology provide with different learning performance tracking and require different delivery packages. And we always ensure the correct output file is generated and tested correctly, like um, Scrum package um, tested on Scrum Cloud. Um, but sometimes our clients require to deliver content in the format of a web output, so they can drop the files on the servers and provide to learners as a web page. But yeah, without extra development, we uh, lose the ability to know anything about the learner, something which is automatically recorded um, with an LMS. Okay, welcome, Joanna. And uh, so hosting a module through a website sounds really convenient. How does that work? I mean, you mentioned that you lose that ability to automatically know anything about the learner, but is there a way to still analyze learner participation and performance? 
Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, with some um, clever development, of course. Um, so for the module Charlotte shared earlier, um, our client wanted the module to be easily accessible um, via their website on many different devices. Uh, but they did not want to lose the ability to know who had completed the training and uh, their performance uh, for later analysis. So we were able to fulfill the client's requirements using custom written JavaScript and inserting web objects into Storyline to allow the client to gather information on user participation and performance. And this data is gathered into one file, which is easily uh, converted into an Excel spreadsheet um, for, for data analysis. Great. So you can input all that clever extra wizardry that goes straight over our heads. <laughs> and then it still <laughs> yeah. means that we can use that data in a nice, easy way. I can definitely see how that could be really useful in targeting and designing future learning, but yeah. also potentially for, for marketing as well. Of course. Okay, so thanks Joanna and Charlotte for that second section. Again, any questions for, for the team, please use that Q&A um, box and send them through to us and I will quiz them for you at the end. So the penultimate dimension on our list was user experience. So, so far Joanna and Charlotte have described how we can transform content into a story, make sure it's, it's encompassed and an accessible learner-centric course design. But Joanna, what do we mean by user experience and why is that aspect so crucial? Why is it on our list? Mm -hmm. So maybe let's start with a short and simple definition of uh, what a UX is. Mm -hmm. um, so user experience design is about designing products that are useful, usable and delightful to interact with. And if you ever struggle to do something that should be simple on a website or an app and you quit out of frustration, um, that's likely due to bad or lack of UX design. And if we limit principle of good UX to just three most important ones, then we could say um, UX is about um, color contrast. So scent and combinations of colors are hard for people to distinguish, especially those with uh, low vision or color blindness. So we pick combinations with a um, um, high enough contrast, like the dark text um, on a light background mm -hmm. to ensure accessib accessibility for all learners. Um, the second point uh, uh, is the font size. Uh, it needs to be large enough to read on the intended device. Uh, yeah, especially for people with low vision and cognitive disabilities who can struggle to, to read um, smaller text. And the last main principle I'd like to mention is consistency. And this refers to keeping things repeatable, like the placement of next buttons and terminology. So for example, you would not use word uh, next and then switch it uh, for continue halfway through the module. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I've definitely given up on a few websites in my time. <laughs> um, what about the audience? Let's launch this with our second poll. How often do you find yourself giving up uh, due to a poor user experience? For example, you've logged on, trying to book yourself an appointment, and it's just too difficult. So you just end up abandoning ship, coming back another time, or perhaps even picking up the phone. Let's see, we've got quite a few people answering now, which is great. We've got here never, that would be very privileged, <laughs> daily, weekly, monthly, or yearly. Let's see what everybody thinks. So I think that's most, most people have answered so far. Let's see if we get any more for coming through now. I think it's quite an equal split there. I think that's the end of the poll there. We've got a split, Quite equal, quite equal between weekly and monthly. Nobody going for never or daily and a couple of just 8% going for yearly. So I think I would have to answer monthly, but that's because I've got very little time to do any of these sort of personal jobs. Um, but I find it really frustrating whenever you, you try and it's, it's just too difficult. And it seems like, you know, user experience is also very crucial for our learning experiences from what Joanna's saying in terms of engagement, participation and concentration, you know, keeping them there and making sure that they, they want to continue with it. So, Joanna, from, from what you've said and from what, you know, from our poll there, we must therefore design everything with user experience at the forefront of our minds. Yeah, yes, absolutely. So user experience comes into everything from 
ensuring the screen size is appropriate, uh, interactions are selected and designed correctly, buttons are large enough and space out enough for the intended device. And uh, in this example, we went for a click anywhere approach to yeah, ensure easy navigation on a mobile device. Mm -hmm. So are there any times where we've ended up, you know, we've started with one design and we've ended up mixing it up a little bit and changing it just purely to improve that user experience? Yeah, yes. And um, yeah, design improvements uh, also belong to, to good uh, UX practice. Um, here you can see um, how we had a lot of detail on a patient history. So we, we group the information into clickable folders to improve interactivity and reduce the information on each screen so it was easier for the learner uh, to read and retain the knowledge. Cool. Yeah, it's nice to see how design of the screens can be altered to just ensure that important information is retained, but also make sure it's really easy for the learner to, to use a module. Yeah. If you don't mind, if we go back to device selection, I mean, Charlotte's explained how that is decided at the beginning of a project, depending on what the learner is likely to use or what the facilitator is likely to use if it's um, a facilitated uh, learning. How do we ensure that the modules or learning we create actually works on the selected device? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously with, with testing, uh, we test our content on um, different devices before delivery. And this includes uh, making module running on different browser for laptops, um, iPad check and uh, mobile test on Android and iOS phones. And having everything checked at the right time um, of development um, allows us to prevent or fix any functionality and accessibility issues. Great, so timing is everything I imagine with that. <laughs> True. <laughs> So uh, remember, as I said before, if you have any questions for Charlotte and Joanna, just use that Q&A section. So we come to our final dimension on the list now for creating a user experience, which is interactions. So as me and Charlotte mentioned at the beginning, we've done a lot of clinical CPD. And I can definitely say it didn't involve any more participation than just sort of scrolling, clicking next, or just reading. So Joanna, again, I'm going to put you in the spotlight here. Uh, what can we do to really transform that experience and, you know, what interactions can we create to make it more engaging experience than just reading and clicking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a creative example of an uh, interaction is, is this slider looking far away from, from standard one in, in Storyline. Um, so our slider head, the, the bit you drag, is, is the whole image. And as you drag it right, text at the top and background change, showing and describing different environment. And the draggable holes changes as well. So sometimes it, it looks like it's walking, sometimes with head down, uh, he's grazing. Um, also some other animals appear in the field as the horse moves. So it basically looks like a journey of the horse uh, with a mini story that happens around him that is yeah, much more engaging for learner to find out more about pasture um, management. Yeah, I love the way that he moves and the background changes with the with the new information to really help that information stick. Can you show us any other interactions that we've created or adapted from the standard? Yes, of course. Um, I will show you um, two more examples of interactions we have created. Um, so here, um, instead of displaying a list of cattle cases uh, to read, we just came up with an idea of a turning table with five folders um, yeah, representing each case. So to discover all the info, you just turn the table right and folder appears. You select folder with the info, go back to turning table to explore another case. And once a case is completed, folder changes its status to, to, to green with a tick. And this functionality is based uh, on a dial interaction um, in Storyline. And for my um, second example, uh, here we could just use a simple click to reveal interaction showing cost of monthly insurance for, for a cat and dog. Mm -hmm. But we went one creative step further and built scratch off interaction where you need to grab a coin and scratch the silver area on insurance certificate. And, and as you drag above the scratch area, the cost underneath reveals yeah, gradually the same happens on cat's insurance documents. And yet yeah, this fun interaction is similar to real life scratching of lottery ticket. You just yeah, want to see what's underneath. You just really want to scratch it off. Yeah. 
So we talked at the start with Charlotte about creating these realistic scenarios. Is there anything that we can do with our interactions to really create a realistic learning environment? Absolutely. Um, so for this example, uh, we wanted the X-ray viewer to be as realistic as possible to, to help the learner feel immersed in the training and make the right decisions. So the learner can adjust the zoom, contrast and exposure, uh, like a real digital X-ray viewer. And also learners are provided with two different X-ray shots um, or can view both shots in the same time they want. And for this interaction, we needed to do some uh, quite advanced um, development with uh, web objects to create really rest, a realistic solution. Yeah, I mean, as a vet, I think this is one of my favorite examples because viewing x-rays and CPD is generally a very grainy picture. You mm -hmm. feel like you almost have to squint your eyes like one of those magic pictures to really try and work out what you're trying to look at. So I love the fact that you can just put yourself in there and really see what you need to look at. Um, what about quizzes? I mean, do you always get some quizzes in e-learning and they can be great for engagement and measuring performance. How can we kind of jazz those up a bit or perhaps make them a bit more interesting? Mm. Yeah, so uh, this example is a quiz about uh, feline lower urinary tract disease. But instead of a yeah, standard quiz, we created a story environment where you follow the day in the life of a, of a cat. Yeah, to discover different triggers and questions um, about this disease. Cool. I like the, the idea of combining a story with a quiz. Uh, do you remember what the cat was called? Do we have a name for him? I don't, I don't, I don't think we did name him, did we? <laughs> I don't think so. Aww, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so can you show us any other examples, Joanna, of using interactions in more of a scenario setting? Um, yes, uh, so uh, here we see um, there are several interactions coming together to immerse the learner uh, in the act of stabilizing a seizing dog. Mm -hmm. um, there are drag and drop interactions for quiz questions, such as selecting the correct drag where you see your selected drag drawn up into the syringe. And also we have some click to reveal elements and animations as you stabilize the dog. Okay. Yeah, I like to see how it all sort of fits together in those in those scenarios. It's really great. How can we use your clever animations and interactions to highlight sort of key parts of a story or scenario? Yeah, I'll show you two, two, two more examples. So like a flicking calendar to show days passing by. And um, another one is the clock ticking to show time passing before the, the next patient checkup. I think, unfortunately, we've just lost the PowerPoint. Let me just reopen that. Maybe a, a connection issue on my part. Just give me two seconds. And I'm guessing that sort of timing really helps to make it seem a little bit more realistic as well for our learners as well, which is what we're really trying to achieve, isn't it? Yes, of course. So, so adding this, this even tiny animation can add up to the story and help you, you know, um, get the connection with, uh, with, uh, with the content. So thank you very much, Joanna and Charlotte. You've talked us through all of these four points that we'll just mention again now. So we saw some really great examples there with Joanna of interactions. What we started with was content transformation. So with Charlotte looking at going from the content monster, that really technically heavy stuff into nice memorable stories. Next, we looked at instructional design. We looked at some techniques to create that learner-centric course design, which is actually accessible, which is obviously pretty key. Uh, we also looked at user experience with Joanna, who enlightened us as to what that was, um, optimizing it to try and maintain the learner concentration. And then Joanna kindly shared with us some amazing examples of interactions that can be used to really then bring that story to life and make that learning experience as engaging as possible. So um, when can we use these learning experiences in animal health? What do you think? So we've got our next poll here. We've got a few possible answers. Is this just something that would be good uh, for clinical training? So for vets and nurses? Is it something just for sales process training, sales support, just for internal training? So things like induction products, services, or would you go for all of the above? Well, quite a few people answering already. Most people for going for all of the above. We'll just let a few more people answer there. Let's see. 
Okay, that's great. So I think most people there have gone for all of the above, which I think is what I would say um, as well, because at Wolf, we actually take on missions involving all of these avenues. And quite frequently, our missions involve a combination. For example, with a new veterinary product or a service launch, we may end up recommending learning materials and experiences to boost communication surrounding that launch, internal training for technical and sales staff on the product, the context perhaps, or the sales process itself. May need support materials for sales staff to help them in physically onboarding those clinics. And then clinical training for vets and nurses, including things like product uses and benefits and things like that. As you've met some of our team today, we have a really dedicated team of vets, nurses, learning experts. We also have graphical designers and developers, so everyone in-house, who can challenge themselves to recommend and create the most innovative solutions to meet our clients' needs. So going from their unique learning objectives, but also importantly, looking at those business KPIs as well. So we've shared quite a few examples with you today, and that can be through e-learning modules. It could be through scenarios, clinical cases, video-based learning, whether that's a mode of action video or perhaps an interactive video, webinars, and even face-to-face -face training with a more interactive element to it. So a final poll for everybody today. How much can interactive e-learning module really boost knowledge retention compared to passive training options? So we've talked a lot today about this is our objective. We're trying to boost you know, knowledge retention. But how much has that been shown? Let's see. So we've got up to 10 percent, up to 25 percent, up to 60 percent or up to 90 percent. So a few of you have answered there, which is great. Most people going for up to 60%, a few for 25 and just 8% going for 90. Okay, I think that ends that poll there, which is great. Most people there, 67% of you went for up to 60%, when actually there was a study that actually said it was up to 50 to 90% which is how much it's been shown that an interactive e-learning module can boost knowledge retention compared to passive training options, which have also been shown to only generate about 8 to 10% of knowledge retention after three months after one of those sort of courses. And that's really key. That's one of the major reasons why animal health companies are looking to transform their learning experiences as well as to performance boosting, impact, flexibility, and the return on investment that's possible. So in summary for today's session, to positively impact performance in the animal health industry, we need to start listening to our learners' needs. Forget about overloading them with content and, you know, just read this, watch this, etc., and start providing really inspiring, innovative learning experiences that they will actually remember in months to come. And as we've talked about today, this can be through employing techniques such as storytelling, learner-centric course design, user experience evaluation, and looking at those innovative, innovative even interactions. Okay, so now we have reached our Q&A part of the session. So Charlotte and Joanna, I hope you're ready. Let's see what sort of questions we've had through. So I've got a question here. I think this must be for Charlotte. You're up first. Okay, Do you yes. find that your experience as a vet nurse helps you when you're designing the learning courses? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think what sets us apart from other agencies is that we're 100% focused in animal health. Um, so we've got, uh, as we said, uh, the added benefit of vets and myself as a nurse on the team. Um, to bring their wealth of experience and knowledge to the learning courses. Um, as I said earlier, you know, we've been in practice ourselves, we understand the subject matter, and of course, we've um, also done our fair share of CPD ourselves too. So we can, we, you know, we can really relate to it. Okay, great. And um, something for both of you here, I'm going to put it to both of you. What experiences or courses do you like creating the most? So we'll go to Joanna first for that one. Okay. Well, I guess for me, it's more about the stage of the project I enjoy most. Um, mm -hmm. So I love to work on, uh, on Alpha's version. So when I take the ugly looking, not fully functional uh, V2 
<laughs> and convert it into you know amazing engaging learning um, experience so um, this stage includes um, inserting graphics into storyline building interactions creating animations and yeah adding any magic dev touches um, mm -hmm. to make the build yeah, meaningful and, and appealing when you get to put the actual wizardry in then <laughs> That's, yeah, that's the thing. Exactly. So for those of you uh, watching that haven't created any learning experiences with us yet, we do go through a stage by stage process. Um, what Joanna's talking through here is we do two stages at the beginning without any design involved, just to show how the module will flow and how the content will be presented. And then the alpha version is where, as Joanna said, the magic happens. We get all the graphics involved and we put it all together and that's when uh, her wizardry skills come into action. So what about you, Charlotte? Which ones do you enjoy the most? Uh, well, just to echo what Joanna said, like from a project manager point of view, it's really nice for me when, you know, I've delivered the version one, version two to the client. And then I obviously hand over to Joanna and I see the transformation take place. So that's really nice um, from my point of view as well to see. Um, for me personally, I think I probably enjoy the more clinical cases um, that we do. So, for example, the, uh, the one we showed earlier. Uh, with the seizuring dog um, I think probably because it's quite relatable for me because you know it reminds me of my days in practice and I can really put my own um, knowledge into it and yeah it's just quite relatable for me so I quite enjoy those ones. Put your own stamp on it I think yeah. for when I was um, working in project management initially as well that was definitely what I enjoyed the most as well really putting uh, putting the effort into those clinical ones. Mm -hmm. So we've got a question here, uh, Charlotte, I feel like you'd probably be able to answer. If not, I can step in. How mm -hmm. long does it take to develop such modules? So the mm -hmm. person asking hasn't asked which ones we're talking about, but I think we're probably talking about those sort of more wow effect ones, like sort of really interactive clinical case style yeah, scenario sure. modules. Yeah, well, as, as you just mentioned, we follow um, a stage by stage process at Wolf. So we... Um, you know, we don't just take everything, go away, you know, for a few weeks and then be like, here's your end product. We really involve the client at every single stage, which is really important because obviously we can get um, the client's feedback on what they like and don't like. And, you know, we really involve them at every step. Um, so we have five um, kind of uh, iterations, so five versions. Mm -hmm. So the version one, version two, um, which, as you said, are just kind of draft black and white versions with no design in. Then we have the alpha version, beta version, and then finally the gold version. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, if we take into account, we'd have like a kickoff meeting in the beginning, um, some project planning, and then obviously the five versions. Each version has a review week in between. So mm -hmm. uh, the client will review it at each stage and feedback to us. So by the time you kind of map that whole process out, it's normally around sort of three to four months, depending, obviously, like we said, on the type of um, course that it is. This is probably based more on, on the ones we've looked at today, so yeah. the interactive ones. Um, obviously, there's a wealth of other things that we can create for you, like, you know, video based training, virtual reality. And so obviously each of these different types will have a different like timeline. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, obviously, we always work with our clients, you know, if they've got a particular deadline in mind, we try and. Yeah you know work towards that obviously without you know compromising on quality or anything like that so sort of yeah. launch dates and, and things like that really yeah sort exactly of towards the, the client yeah. deadline for that yeah definitely yeah so we'll always work with the client on any deadlines that they've got and um and come to some kind of timeline really but yeah sort of I, I don't know if you agree with that Becky sort of three to four yeah, months I would say I would for the say whole so. process to happen yeah. And obviously, if we've got additional modules, then then that can sort of extend things a little bit. Yeah. And as sure. you rightly said, you know, there's lots of other products that we do create and they do vary quite a lot in timelines, you know, shorter ones um, yeah. for the sort of micro module type learning and uh, video based and things like that. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Great. So, Joanna, there's one specifically for you here. You'll be pleased to know. Okay. Uh, you mentioned font size being important in your user experience. Yeah. What sort of font size are we talking about? <laughs> uh, so yes, um, to, I need to mention about two two products we uh, we work with. Uh, so when working with Adobe products like um, Illustrator and Photoshop, this is the, where our designers um, work to create all the graphics for us. Um, so they use um, uh, the rule is in general to keep the font in Adobe at least twenty four points for normal text mm -hmm. and nineteen for bold. 
And this allows designer to plan how much space the text will take and how much will be left for, for graphics. And then uh, when we uh, developers uh, take over, um, step in into uh, the process and start working with Storyline, uh, we use uh, fonts at least 18 points uh -huh. uh, big for, for normal text and um, at least 14 um, for bold. Then we ensure that the design created by our graphic designers uh, matches the font size in Storyline. Okay, great. And I'm guessing it varies a little bit with sort of device selection and things like that as well. Yeah, of course. Okay, great. Uh, so another one here for you, Charlotte, um, mm -hmm. about um, measuring feedback and performance measurement. And this is something that we didn't actually uh, cover uh, today. So you mentioned at the beginning about, uh, you know, we look to really impact performance and, and measure that. Mm -hmm. How can we look to really measure sort of feedback or performance uh, from our learners? Um, so the one that kind of springs to mind first is the NPS, so the Net Promoter mm -hmm. Score. Um, so it's really popular. Um, so obviously we can't share any specifics without uh, our client's consent, but we have had some really good NPS scores um, as high as 90%, which is obviously incredible. Um, and then we did have one project where vet nurses uh, rated their confidence in approaching weight management. Um, it was a weight, weight management course that we did. So um, they rated their confidence before and after the course. Um, and it was really nice to see uh, the way their confidence level increased as a result of, um, of completing the course. And is that something that, you know, we, we decide within Wolf? Is it something the client decides? When do we sort of look at how we're going to actually measure the performance at the end of the, end of the module? Um, so this is all discussed when we have the kickoff meeting mm -hmm. at the beginning. So uh, we basically, you know, all clients have different ways of measuring the impact of, of the learning. Um, and like I said, the NPS is a really good way of doing that. So we would advise to embed the MBS, uh, MPS sorry, into the end of their module. Um, and then we can then obviously collect that data and see um, at the end sort of how well received the module's been. Um, it gives the learners opportunity to leave not only a rating, but a comment as well. Um, so we can get some really good feedback on how well received the, the module is. Um, and also, I guess when you're, if you're doing something, so say, for example, it's for sales reps, you might be able to measure, um, you know, the sales of that product have gone up as a result of the sales reps doing the training. You know, there's various different ways of kind of measuring that impact. Um, and it's sort of very client specific, really. So we would discuss that, uh, that with them. At so the working beginning. with them to really establish what success means and yeah. working back from them. Yeah. Cool. Um, so there's one final question here um, for us, which is for sales training, is there a specific style that you suggest more than others? Mm -hmm. So I will pick that one up for you guys. Um, but essentially what we always do is everything that we do is bespoke. So it depends on the client's needs, their objectives and KPIs. So just as Charlotte was explaining at the beginning um, so and also device selection all those sort of things the learners that we're targeting so quite often with sales training we may recommend you know that might be a micro module which is nice and easy a quick trick to access on mobile phone devices they can do in the car uh, it's very neat looking um, it may be something that is better off being a face-to-face -face training with some interactive elements. We quite often do, you know, Charlotte uh, shared a really great example of a clinical case. And we quite often make those into sort of scenario based, so almost like a virtual role play. So at the end, they've either convinced the customer or not, perhaps, and involving all those steps of the sale process. For some clients, they really want it to be, you know, or it needs to be technology wise, sort of a power, more of a PowerPoint based. And that can either be facilitated or self-learning with a little bit more, um, you know, interaction than, than your standard sort of PowerPoint. So really, it's a tricky one to answer because it very much depends on the needs, uh, the budget, the timeline and, you know, all of those uh, aims and objectives that we need to hit. And so we look at that all at the very beginning when we create that that recommendation stage. So I hope that answers that one. So you will be pleased to know, uh, Charlotte, Joanna, that is it for your <laughs> quiz questions, unless there's any in the chat, which I don't think there is. Um, let's see. Nope, that's it. So you've got away reasonably lightly on that <laughs> front. So uh, that concludes our session for today. So I just want to say thank you very much to everyone who joined us. 
we will send you out a recorded replay in the next couple of days if you had to pop out and get a cup of tea or you feel like you missed anything. I would also like to say thank you very much to my lovely teammates for accompanying me today. So thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Joanna. It's been lovely to have you. And watch this space. We plan to release some more webinars in 2022. And what we will look to do is delve into some of these case studies in more detail, really look at a project from beginning to end and, and how we create those. So I just want to say have a really lovely afternoon to everybody and goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>